Deputy Collins. Um, I'll be fairly brief because I'm, I'm not really um, au fait with an awful lot of uh, the building aspects. Um, but what I will say at the very opening of my contribution is that we are in a, a crisis, we're in an emergency, and um, people have no homes. Um, and from my mind, this whole project, this committee, was to sit down with the people that can build and that have the knowledge how to build. And, you know, when you, you make the point, um, Mr. Parlin, about the average, say, 300,000, you're using that as a ballpark um, figure for a building, about 150,000, that would be on construction costs and uh, labour. Um, I would really like a breakdown of all that, because I know on many sites now, um, there's no direct labour, it's RTCs, um, that, you know, self-employed, and somebody would employ five workers or ten workers to go onto the site, and that's a deal made with the developer beforehand and that. So I, I don't really believe the prices that we're, we're seeing coming out. Now, maybe they're true. I don't know. Um, but 150 grand on, on costs, I'd like to see the breakdown of the materials. I'd like to see the breakdown of the labour, how that's done, how much it costs per, you know, in relation to labour, how much the VAT is costing, how much um, the development levies are costing, and how much, as, as the point has been raised, and I know the, the profit margins, how much the industry expects the profit mar margins right across the board. Um, and if that's the case, and that there was a genuine approach, because I think people just don't believe it anymore. We've gone through an awful lot, and um, people don't trust developers, they don't trust builders anymore. So um, if, if there was a willingness from the building industry to work with the state from the point of view of saying, this is about the actual cost, and this is what we would we'd be willing to accept, but then I think there'd be more open approach from the state to say, well, okay, we'll work with you on this. We'll try and see if we can provide uh, certain... Um, uh, the, the, the amenities that's needed, like drains and, and water pipes and that sort of thing. But I don't think we can do that until we get, or we feel we have an honest appraisal from the construction industry about that, and in relation to how much profits they really want. And then do, does the construction industry, one last question, think that there should be sort of a cap on land prices over the next period of time, like we had in the report in, um, a few decades ago, um, to try and stop the inflationary aspects of um, the, the price of houses into the future um, in relation to... Uh, cost, construction costs and all that is a way that that can be worked with that. Everybody gets a fair cut out of this, everybody makes some sort of a profit, everybody gets a job and everybody um, get, gets a benefit from it rather than it going the other direction again. Uh, Justin, we'll take one or two more questions but Deputy Collins in a bid to be helpful. If Mr Parland doesn't have all the cost answers, mm -hmm. the chartered surveyors are next and they may have some more detailed answers and you might want to continue that line of questioning with them, but we'll see what Mr Parland says at that point in time. Uh, Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan. Thank you very much. Um, just a few questions. The first one you mentioned, and we, we are hopeful that there will be a minister that dedicated to housing, and you mentioned about access, and I think that came up at the meeting last week. So um, my first question is if you would prioritise what you mean on that access coming from your industry, what you think is needed to make to, to get movement going on this. The second one is relation to the skills required and capacity to build. And you were saying that there's no skill shortage, but yet we know that there was a major fall off in the number of apprenticeships. So I'm just wondering how that is being resolved. Um, you know, I would have known from my previous career um, the importance of apprenticeships to quite a number of people and the disappointment when they were not on stream in the past number of years. So you mentioned about solace. So again, um, just if you could fill us in on that. Third one is about land bank and availability. And I'm trying to get some sense of if we knew the amount of land that is available to build on in the near future, not being built on, and what the capacity is there. And what, in your opinion, from your industry, are the biggest stumbling blocks to that movement going forward as soon as possible. And my last question is in relation to ghost estates, um, where we are on that from your industry and the potential for your industry to make progress on those. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. And the final question in, in this se section, uh, Deputy Quinlevin. Yes, dear person. Um, <clears throat> just firstly, uh, I'm delighted you start off with your first line that the housing market is dysfunctional at, pres at present. I think it's important that you said that as well. Um, you, you talk about we need a substantial investment in infrastructure. Maybe you might go into that type of more detail. I have a huge problem with your, on page five of your, your submission on the part five contributions. Now, I believe that 
if we moved off, and I think Deputy Cowan, <coughs> Deputy Cowan said, and I would reiterate that, it should be 20% of, of houses built should be for a social function. And we had a huge discussion in a previous sitting of this committee about the fact that we don't want to build houses that are totally social housing states anymore. We don't want to go down that line. The Minister also has announced the Housing Project 2020, and in that, for instance, you talk there in your second paragraph of your, of your introduction that as long as the house, as long as market value of existing and new homes is less than that of replacement cost, little to no private household activity will take place. For instance, in, in his, in his um, submission that, uh, of the housing bill that he's done in a hospital in County Limerick, for instance, uh, you can buy a house there for €75,000, and you, they, the bill that he has estimated on that is €185,000. Obviously, that would deliver four houses, but you can buy ten, and there is a number of houses for sale in that area. You could buy ten for the same price, so why would you actually build them there when we don't? I think um, we need to either start a massive purchasing of the housing that are available and put people, because people are homeless at the moment, there is a crisis, people have nowhere to go, we can't wait two to three years for, for houses to be built. You're saying you can't build them because the market is too low, um, I think we'll have to, you know, in, set intervention and buy those houses. Thank and you, Deputy. Obviously, obviously I have a huge concern that the 1% that you suggest in part of the pro part five would be used for the infrastructure of houses that you build that delivers no social units, and that's the concern I have about the thank, thank you, Deputy. Mr. Parlin. Okay, well, I'll just cover some of them, and then I'll get you over to some of my colleagues who want to come in. Um, Deputy Cowan, first of all, um, he talks about the, the uh, last, uh, Hubert will deal with the certification and the compliance costs, but the availability of funds, uh, there's no question that is a major problem. And the chartered surveyors uh, at the presentation that I heard from their chairman recently, and uh, I'm sure he'll give it to you firsthand here today, was suggesting there could be up to 21,000 cost of financing this 300,000 home. Um, and that's a crazy, crazy cost at the moment. And that assuming, uh, which is probably most cases that the builder has to borrow everything. He goes to the bank for his 60 percent and he has to go to a mezzanine or somebody else uh, who are talking about double digit figures. Uh, we certainly believed, and there was a great lot of hoo-ha about the announcement about uh, from ISAF and of Activate Capital that we're putting this 500 million together for house building and that we're going to fund up to 500 or up to 90 percent. Uh, which sounded very, very good. But when the detail came out initially, I think they were talking about, was it 13 or 14 per cent, Hubert, and then they eventually brought it down, talked about 10 per cent. But even after that, as you sell the units, there's another 1.5 per cent uh, levy on top of those. So it did appear that that particular fund was, the first priority was not to upset the banks and not to undercut the banks or whatever. And, uh, you know, so the funding is a problem, major, major problem. We know from different uh, contributions and from seeing what's happening that the European Central Bank are almost attempting to give money away at the moment. They just want it out there into the economy so as you can spend. There was this concept of helicopter money at one stage that, you know, just you got it and you spend it and that was going to be good. Um, and we know that if you have a deposit or if you're lucky enough to have a deposit at the moment, uh, you'd be very lucky to get any return. You might even be charged for some bank taking care of it for you. So that money is out there. We know that the Exchequer can borrow very, very uh, cheaply at less than 1% and yet when we want to go and provide and I'm talking genuinely on behalf of the industry that any builder that sticks his neck up and says I want to build 10 houses or 15 houses or 100 houses and goes to his bank I can tell you it's, it's a major challenge to get the banks to engage first of all and when to do if and when to do it's a 60% maximum and that's for you know, you need to be well up to the mark to get that and then to get the rest of it is, it's, it, it's very difficult for a very important piece of absolutely critical infrastructure that is that is you know so whether it be the fiscal rules or the issue or whatever uh, we did meet with the governor of the central bank and he said that the central bank even at european level wouldn't be involved in lending on any speculative basis or uh, so on so you know but i don't see that the the provision of much needed housing infrastructure would be in any degree speculative. So I would hope, and I know there have been a number of proposals around this, that the government will come up with some sort of a formula that they can take advantage of the very cheap money that is available over 20 to 30 year period and invest it in and give the builders, because in the end of the day, and the chartered surveyors will go into this, the end of the day, all the costs have to be passed on to the first time buyer. That's just the unfortunate reality. And that's the point that we made about part five the Part 5 contribution that you're obliged to pay at the moment has to be added on to your costs, and it's the first-time buyer who pays it. 
And we feel that in that crisis that the first-time buyers find themselves in and the country finds itself in, it doesn't make sense to be asking that particular beleaguered sector to make the contribution. Uh, and that's why we put it, if we put the 1% across all the boards, certainly touching a bigger market and, and, uh, and bringing in a, a lot more money. Uh, Hubert, I'll ask him just afterwards to deal with it. In terms of Deputy Collins and the crisis that's out there, um, we have an absolute breakdown of the costs and hopefully the Chartered Surveyors because we got a registered Chartered Surveyor to provide our costs and they can give their own independent costs. And I know the report uh, that he gave, he made a point of saying he didn't consult with any member of the Irish House Builders of the CIF in terms of coming up with the costs. But we know that Chartered Surveying is an exact science. If you take your typical house and the new standards that are available, the Chartered Surveyor will tell you exactly the degree of groundworks to be done, the number of blocks that are needed, the cost of plastering, the amount of timber, the number of roof tiles, the, 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 all the internal stuff and so on. So it is a very exact science and there's nobody pulling the wool over anyone's eyes. And even in terms of efficiency now and the competition that there are, unless you're a very efficient builder and able to build that and deliver that house, you know, with the minimum of, of extras or waste, you won't be featuring in terms of whether it be an individual buyer or a local authority or anybody else. Um, a cap on land prices, I think we'd all love that. Uh, a lot of people have invested in land, a lot of people, you know, a lot of the stuff has been washed out, has been sold off. We see all the sites that were bought for uh, 50 million an hour being sold off at auction for 10 and 12 million and that's all. So that is making its own readjustment. Uh, but certainly the cap that is on land prices at the moment is the value of the site. If you can get somebody to pay you 400,000 uh, for a house in Clontarf, for example, or in South County Dublin, it probably is factoring in a side cost of maybe 80 to 100,000. Uh, if you're trying to get a market to a first-time buyer who has a maximum of 300,000 and is uh, 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 working very, very hard to fit into the central bank uh, guidelines, uh, the maximum uh, that you can uh, accommodate that house on is probably 30,000 and maybe something less. Um, the Deputy O'Sullivan raised the issue about the, um, the skill shortage and certainly, you know, in 2006, we were building close to 90,000 houses. Last year, it was just something uh, along with 10,000 houses. So there's been a total sort of over the cliff reaction. So clearly, all of the people that were involved in house building, you know, have either, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them didn't get the chance to finish out their apprentices, and that was a sad situation. And in fairness to FOSS at the time and ourselves, we we worked very, very well together to try and assist people to finish out their apprentices. But a lot of those people have got skills. A lot of those people are gone. Uh, but I'm saying currently. Uh, and we're monitoring this very carefully. Currently, there isn't a skill shortage, but we expect if it's ramped up that that will happen, particularly for the wet trades. And there's been little or no plasters or block layers or floor and wall tilers have gone through, and we've been working hard to try and, and, and get that ramped up. We are working with Sullis now and with the ETBs around the country, and they're currently putting on courses uh, for specialties like Formwork is a big thing. It's where you, where you build the wooden cases for to pour the mass concrete to build uh, sort of high-rise blo uh, office blocks or apartment blocks or hotels at the moment. It's very difficult to get formwork contractors. Uh, and we're, we're, we have courses being set up at the moment that will give some people the basic skills that will be able to go on site. Secondly, uh, dry lining which is the internal uh, uh, partitions and the, the insulation of those, that's a particular skill in itself that you probably don't need three or four years as an apprentice. But if you get a 10-week course and you get then another 10 weeks on site, you can pick up those skills for somebody who knows about it already. But sites have become very, very sophisticated, sophisticated places. You don't no longer have guys leaning on their shovel on a site. You're probably hard set to find a shovel on a site. First of all, from health and safety regulations, like you have got to go through a very rigorous, the last thing a builder wants on site is somebody who's going to be a danger to himself or somebody else. So, you know, uh, being site ready is quite a challenge for a lot of unemployed people or, or, or unskilled people at the moment. But it's something that we're working very, very closely with the Department of Education, with Sullis, uh, and with the ETBs. And I have to say, in fairness to the ETBs, we're getting some very positive response. And Sullis tells me that they are uh, providing substantial extra funding for training those people. And we know that um, this Pathways to Work initiative by the Department of Social Welfare that have offices all over the country now, we're engaging with them as well as very strong potential employers. And, you know, they're interviewing people that are on the live register. Uh, they're interviewing some of our members that are keen to take them on and they're upskilling those people, uh, you know, to, to make them site ready. So, um, you know, I think we're making progress there. Uh, it, you know, if we get an explosion in house building, certainly we will have a problem. 
And as we know before, uh, skilled people will arrive from all over the world, as they did before. And hopefully a lot of our people that have emigrated and have gone elsewhere will, will choose to come back. Uh, you raised the issue about ghost estates. You know, ghost estates largely have been resolved. Um, except in some of, the, some of the, the, the areas out there where there isn't sort of local employment and so on. Uh, but a lot of work has been done there. Um, and to Deputy Quinle Quinlevin, uh, the, yeah, the problem about part five again. I think, you know, 20% of nearly nothing was very little. So when the house building sort of almost stopped, there was little or no contribution being made to part five. Um, the change now to the to the five percent. It's still a pretty difficult um, uh, uh, area, and if either of these gentlemen want to tell you how difficult it is to to manage it on site, they can feel free. But it's still a difficult area to manage, and it's still you know at. Building 11 or 12,000, it's still making a very minor contribution to social housing. And it is, as I said, passing that cost onto the first time buyers. So, what we did propose, you know, the 1% levy right across the board, uh, you know, spreads the cost and, uh, and raises substantially the, the, the income that would be. Uh, that would be uh, you just raised the issue that I did hear someone saying about, and as Hubert has said, you know, you can buy houses throughout the country substantially cheaper then you can build them at the moment. And that's why there isn't any building. And certainly we would encourage uh, a lot of those units to be bought up where they are available. But certainly where the biggest housing uh, shortages are, uh, there aren't uh, houses available to buy at that sort of price. And I suppose the other thing, and compared to the, you mentioned the 75,000 that can be bought in hospital, it's probably going to be an entirely different animal to the new uh, 175,000 house that's built under the new building regulations that has all the bells and whistles and in terms of uh, um, uh, energy efficiency and, and all the other uh, areas would be an entirely different animal. Uh, but we've had this debate before about, you know, when people are starting off to buy their first car, they don't normally want, aspire to a Mercedes or a BMW to start off with a Ford Focus or a, a Volkswagen Golf. And, uh, you know, if that standard of safety and, and so on is very good, they work themselves up until then. Perhaps uh, we've gone a little bit over the top in terms of the, 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 the size of house and the standards that we are setting in terms of the affordability issue. Hubert, Thank you. Hubert. Chair, Chairman, a number of points there. With regard to the sort of compliance costs, the industry fully supported the introduction of the Building Control Amendment Regulations 2014. It did provide the end user, the consumer, with much greater level of oversight and certification and security that the buildings had been built according to the standards. The figure of €20,000 that's quoted for compliance with the regs is too much on the high side. Uh, because I would expect that €20,000 would include a lot of other costs that you know, the developer would have had to incorporate in any event, such as co cost of drawings and so on. So I would see the real certification costs for compliance with BCAR would be closer to two and a half to €3,000 rather than the €20,000. But by and large, um, the building and amendment regulations provide much greater level of oversight for the end user, certainty that the buildings have been constructed to the required standards, and we certainly are supportive of the consumer having, having that level of oversight. With regard to the development of town centre sites and CPO legislation, I would have hoped that the CPO legislation you know, would have been adequate. If it requires amendment or review, we'd fully support it. Uh, I think the renewal of the town centre sites should be supported for a quantified and a specific type of development. It wouldn't be open-ended that we want to ensure that you don't end up with an oversupply of any particular type of properties in any particular area, and we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past. Just a point in relation to the Section 48 development contributions. Section 48 development contributions are used to fund um, infrastructure in any part of the local authority area. So somebody buying a new house in one town might be funding the, the building of a community centre or other type of development in a totally other area of the, of the local authority. The Section 48 development contributions were introduced at a time when there was no property tax payable and there was no other type of taxation payable by, by, by the houses at all. And we would view the Section 48 development levy as being one that could be replaced by the property tax. We still support the Section 49s, special development levies that pertain to particular developments where specific works are required in order to, to, to support that, that, that type of unit. Um, 
And if I might just make a point in relation to the help to buy scheme, Chairman. Uh, we are aware that there are a lot of people who would traditionally have been able to provide for their own housing needs and they were able to buy their own house. And some of those people now are falling back on social housing waiting lists, which ends up being more expensive for the exchequer if they're able to meet that need. And we feel a small leg up uh, under a help to buy scheme, whereby the state did take up to a 20% stake in, in a house, would actually be good value for money for the exchequer because ultimately the purchaser would buy out that 20% that, 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 that in, in, in due course. So I hope there are some of the other points that were, that were addressed there, Chairman. Uh, can, can I, I have a number of other contributors. The answer that was given, I think it's important to tease out the answer that was given, and I, I disagree with some of the points that's been made. Which answer? In relation to certification costs. The costs may be, may be as you refer to, but the charges that has been charged to the end user are far in excess of what they should be. Would you not agree that there should be a new licensing system in relation to the way it's patrolled or policed and that local authorities have a role, considering initially they were supposed to have a role under the old legislation with the compliance offices within local authorities? I think it's, 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 you know, the costs in relation to one-off, are you aware of those costs? That what is being charged by those that are given this certification? I accept and I agree that of course the end user must have some sense of security in relation to the compliance and the, the reliability of the work that's been done and so forth and that's built in compliance with building regulations and, 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 and planning permission and so forth. But I mean these costs are way in excess of what they should be and it has to be addressed. And I, I don't accept that you say that those charges uh, are, are, are near to two and three thousand. I have many constituents, it's far in excess of that. Many people around this town and this city are, getting, are being charged way in excess of that too and it's something that has to be addressed. Chairman, the, yeah, yeah, Chairman the, the, in, in many instances, um, the people were building houses, sometimes from planning drawings. And building has become extremely complex over the last number of years with regard to the depth of regulations that are in place, and particularly if you look at compliance with Part L of the building regulations. In those situations where some builders have been asked to build houses from planning drawings, that, that was not adequate. And we actually did need properly structured, properly designed um, drawings submitted for building purposes. And I do know that many people who are building one-off houses had, had, um, had incorporated the whole design fees into what they call building compliance, uh, the building control amendment regulations costs. Uh, so you must break it down into the work required to the detail, for the detailed design of the house and then the certification costs for actually going in and oversee, overseeing the development. And, you know, when we break it down on that basis, the costs are, are closer to 2,500 to 3,000 euros, euros per, 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 per house. The one-off housing sector certainly is seen as in a different light. They are seeing the, the other design costs. They are viewing the design costs that they now have to undertake as being part of this compliance issue. But I'll be happy to go through it with you, Deputy. You know, if, if you question is, is in relation to the local authorities and the role that they have. And do you not accept that a good licensing system, similar to what's in the UK and the north of Ireland, for example, is bringing those costs down but is, is as efficient, if not more efficient, than the present system? You know, many people say it's a divvy up for the sector. Sorry, Chair. You know, for, for surveyors. back in on the questions. I would have loved to. It's just yeah. I have the surveyors outside and there were issues that came up I want to follow on with. Um, can I just ask them, uh, to on the RTCs on labour, direct labour costs in the construction industry as well? Because I, I, what I'll do at this stage is I'll take the remaining questions okay. and then, then allow for completion. Dep Deputy Catherine Byrne. Thanks, uh, thanks Chair. And, uh, they're more, more observations rather than questions. And thank you very much for this morning. Now, I suppose we're all here for the one reason. Uh, put some kind of formula together that people can have a home, whether it's in social housing or private housing. Um, Mr McFarland, you said in your presentation there was one or two things. We had Eugene Cummins and Dick Brady here from the local authorities from Roscommon and Dublin City Council last week, and Dick Brady said there was over 22,000 sites available for local authority housing across the city. And I'm wondering, is there any kind of way that you have already viewed or have any idea of what kind of sites there and how, build, how big housing estates can be built on them. Some of them I would imagine are very small. If you travel across the city any time of the day, you'll see small sites which have been lying there for, even when through the boom, are still lying there and a lot of them are still just left with nothing on them. I suppose the reason why I'm asking is because you said that um, 
you know, to review these sites would be very important for the construction industry, and I agree with you. But is it not true that many of the larger construction companies don't want to build any kind of housing because it's not profitable enough? And the builders who were building small banks of houses, unfortunately, don't have the money anymore. And that's, you've made that quite clear. And I'm, I'm, I'm just asking if, if any kind of formal um, talks have been with the councils around the sites they have, and if they do, if you have, have you any idea um, at the amount of sites that you are in the capacity of housing that they would hold? Uh, there was something that jumped off the page to I me, mean, just around social housing, and tenants should not be allowed to uh, uh, have a sale of a house if it's uh, below the replacement cost. And for me, who have dealt with, and many of my colleagues who have dealt with people living in social housing all our life, um, many of those people have lived in those houses 40 and 50 years. And I think anybody wanting not to allow them buy their house, which they've already probably paid half a mortgage or maybe full mortgage, I said this, I believe is disappointing because I believe people who live in social housing should have the right to buy as well. And if they've lived there over a certain amount of time, and I think it's a very fair process that city council do, and I'm only familiar with them and Dublin South County Council to allow their tenants buy. I think it's very important. I agree with you about the over living over the shops. I think it's very important. But you know, in a lot of the urban areas, country areas now, uh, unfortunately, there just isn't a there just isn't a population in many of the small urban towns. A lot of young people have left. They've come to the cities because that's where the work is. There's a number of issues why people don't live in the country, and we won't we won't go into them the countryside. Um, just and the last thing as well is just around I suppose, um, first time buyers and all of the young people who were caught up in the property boom and bought houses which were extortionary prices and now find themselves um, not living in many of those houses and having to rent them out. And some of them having to move back home with their parents because just because of the mortgage and things like that. And is there any, have you any um, suggestions or construction, any suggestions about people who are living in negative equity now and what can be done with, for those to help them now and into the future? Because many of these young people, as already I think Mr Fitzpatrick said, they're falling back now into the social housing thing, and many of them have had to give back their keys reluctantly. And some of them wanted to because they just couldn't live. And have you any, uh, any um, suggestions that might be able to be help us in this process that we're going through on that particularly? Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Ryan. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just returning to the Part 5 again, certainly I would agree with others who feel that should be 20%. But in your own contribution in the paper here, you indicate that the operation of Part 5 contributes to restricting new res residential building activity and put upward pressure on all costs. Now, you've dealt with the costs, but in terms of restricting new activity, I would question that. Now, my sense of the building industry is that for other reasons uh, altogether, the building industry would prefer to, to have private estates and not have an element of social housing within it. And is that not the real truth in terms of why you would prefer to see the Part 5 kind of restricted in some way? In terms of your suggestion for a 1% levy, in the past Part 5, where local authorities were in a position to take money instead of delivering housing, that money just went into a black hole and there were no houses delivered. So why would your suggestion here be any different? And isn't there, isn't there a real case for saying where there's building activity on a site that you should at least deliver something while, while the planning is underway, when the, the development is underway? In terms of your, your suggestion as well, in terms of VAT, um, your suggestion to reduce fat. Now, if that could incentivise the industry, that would be very welcome. What guarantee could you give us that that wouldn't be absorbed? Because uh, there's a poor track record there in terms of where incentives were given to kind of homeowners, to, you know, first time grants, all of that kind of stuff. Typically, it went onto the price of the house and didn't benefit the consumer whatsoever. And finally, in terms of the, your Section 3 and development levies, you've set out a structure in terms of your paper where estimated costs are included at the end, but under this one you seem to suggest that there's no cost, and there would be no cost to uh, a change in that development levy. But you do say at this point that local property tax should be appropriately structured 
so that adequate revenues are raised. Now, currently, we have the property tax, we have the levy, so there is an income there. And if it's taken away, well, then there's a loss of income, so there has to be a cost. So are you suggesting that the property tax should be increased to take account of any reduction in this levy? Thank you. Yeah. Deputy Butler. Um, my line of question is actually similar to both of the last two speakers. Um, would you accept that there's an over-reliance on local authorities to provide social housing? Um, as uh, Deputy Barnes said, we did have Eugene Cummins in last week and the County and City Management Association. And what they stated was the local authorities are not developers. Um, even if we had the adequate resource to build on our lands, the regulations stipulate that we can only build 10 to 15 per cent for social housing. And there's actually a real perception out there that the Federation would much prefer to stay away from social housing and hand it over to the Council. And that's why they want to reduce the Part 5. That's the impression that's out there. Um, the other thing I would also like to say, um, I would like you to expand on that point about any sale of existing social housing stock to tenants should not be below replacement. Because like what Deputy Byrne said, there are people that are 20 and 30 years in their house and it was only this year that it was reintroduced by the, by the current government that you could have the opportunity to buy your house. It wasn't available for the past few years. And the third point I'd like to make is this Housing and Homelessness Committee is actually for the whole of Ireland, you know, and we're, we're, we keep referring to a house, a starter home for 300,000, whereas um, my constituency is Waterford and you could actually be... Um, by a three-bed semi new build for 165 or a, um, a four-bed detached for 240,000, which people still find too expensive. But it's just, just to push it in, into scale that it is a, um, a, a countrywide problem, not only, even though I know it's extremely um, prevalent in Dublin, it's a countrywide problem. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, in this section, Deputy Function. Um, thanks, Chair. Yeah, just a lot of the points have already been raised, but I suppose the part five I would also disagree with. Say, not only when you provide the 20% are you providing the, the physical homes, but some of the best estates that we have that operate really well throughout the country are where the part five was at 20%, and I would agree that if, if it's going to be replaced by a levy or money, there's no guarantee that will actually go into social housing. Um, there was also some talk as well about the labour costs and the wages and I just think it's important to make the point that the average worker in the sector is not coming out as a millionaire and I just think that we, we need to be strong on that point that it's uh, people who have, have suffered a lot of uh, wage decreases in that sector and an awful lot of people in construction, particularly in rural areas, are out of employment and may not ever have the opportunity to, to get back into that area. So I just want to, to make that point because it's been talk about labour costs and I don't want that to kind of be the impression that the cost of the building is, is only in relation to the wages, because it certainly isn't. Um, an interesting point that I think in your the last part, urban regeneration, I think that's actually a really good idea, because obviously we know the part of the problem is, is the supply of housing, but we also know there's a huge amount of vacant properties, whether it's rural or urban, and it would be great for a lot of villages and towns. It would increase employment, it would increase activity, so I just would like to know if you could give us a little bit more information about how you would see that work and you may not have that info here with you now but if you could pass it along because it's an excellent idea because not only is it something that's more immediate for people who are either facing homelessness or currently homeless but it, it also feeds into a whole wider social argument about regenerating our towns and villages. You know, like any constituency you go to that has a mix of, of rural and urban, all you will see is property after property and places that really have just become like ghost towns. So I just I think that's a good point, but I'd like to get some more information on how you would see that actually working. Thanks. Thank you, Deputy. Just before Mr. Parland, just to say to colleagues, the next section with the surveyors, a number of the issues that will probably overlap, so we can follow those up. Mr. Parland, a number of questions. Okay, well, I'll cover uh, Deputy Byrne, uh, first of all, yeah. um, raised a number of issues about the small sites that we still see. And thankfully, I, I, I just look out for sites and I sort of cycle and I walk around the city quite a bit, and I do see them, you know, the ones that have been there a long, long time, back through the good days that are beginning, beginning to be sold off, obviously, at some sort of a reasonable, reasonable site. And certainly, there's a lot less cost involved in developing a site because chances are the water passes by, the sewage passes by, and there's street light outside, and so on. So they do lend themselves. You raised the issue about the first-time buyers who bought at expensive houses and what sort of prospect. Thankfully, the figures would show that people in negative equity are on the decline. Uh, 
happened a personal experience of myself. Uh, but you know, I suppose the the um, prices going up is one factor. If that were to happen, and I think they've stabilised fairly well. Interest rates and all the indications are that interest rates are going to stay very, very low. And I know there is pressure now uh, on the banks to reduce the actual uh, mortgage rates and so on. And I'd hope that that will be dealt with by the new government coming in. So I'd hope there's some, some light at the end of the tunnel for those sort of people. Uh, Deputy Ryan um, raised the issue about Part 5. And again, is it the whole social aspect of not wanting a social housing in a development? And I know you've had, reading from some of the, the, the transcripts, you've had a fairly lively discussion about that here earlier. And that's, that's an issue, whether it be people objecting or whether people not wanting to buy. Uh, you know, that we provide the product and we put it up there. And so on, as far as we're concerned, we don't have any prejudice in that area. If the government says you've got to do X, Y or Z, we do that. And it may have implications otherwise, but I think the the, the stigma, and I don't really mean it, but the, 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 what previously applied to social housing isn't the case anymore because nearly 90% of the people now that are on housing lists are people that, uh, that, that don't make the central bank. Uh, it is no other stigma attached to it. It's just they can ill afford uh, to buy. So I think that's an issue that is going to become more apparent. But the industry and builders don't have any issue. Uh, it is purely the economic point that we're making. Uh, and you know, I know there's opposition to it. I would expect if there was a 1% levy that it would be entirely ring-fenced uh, and it would go directly in rather than go anywhere else. Because I know there was a lot of local authority levies that were collected in the past that, uh, uh, that disappeared into other uh, 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 obligations that they had as well. Um, the issue, and that the question comes back all the time, what guarantee if the VAT is reduced uh, that it will be reflected in the price? And that's a tricky one. Uh, as I said, one of my colleagues here has said already, just currently, if the VAT were to go, uh, were to be changed in the next while, it will be reflected in any price that people have offered to pay or deposits are, are put there. Uh, there was a change in the hospitality sector. I've heard the Minister of Finance several times saying, if I'm watching, if prices of hotels go up or prices of meals go up, I'll have a, a rethink about it. My understanding is that the exchequer return, both in terms of the taxes coming in and the massive lot of people that are involved in every hotel room being uh, filled and every, uh, you know, there's a sites and a, a shortage of hotel rooms around the country now, that that has given a major boost to the industry. And I'd hope that that model would be looked at in terms of what, what applies. Um, in terms of passing it on, even like a margin, you need a margin. If you do your figures now to build uh, 100 houses, you do all your costings out, you get your chartered surveyor to do the costing and so on, and you've got to factor in your VAT at 13.5%. Uh, and if you can save a bit on the levies, the chartered surveyors did suggest, I think, that if there was a 6,000 across the country uh, local authority levy, it would save, you know, seven or 8,000. If the, if the financing costs were halved, it could save 10 or 12,000. And if the VAT was reduced to the 9%, it would save close on 12,000 again. And that collectively would add up to nearly 30,000 of a saving. Now, if that 30,000 means that, that the bank say, go ahead, build those 100 houses, you've still got to take the chance on building. I suppose the other thing, there is no speculative building of 100 houses. If you had planning permission, and these two gentlemen might wrap my knuckles when I go, but if they were, have planning permission for 100 houses at the moment, chances are they will build a show house or two to show off the style of houses and they'll build a few more and they will, uh, they'll get onto the agent and he will receive people. Somebody told me uh, recently that they had about 1,100 people that had come to look at houses and have to, to eventually give 70 uh, deposits. So there's an awful lot of lookers and a lot, a lot of people that would aspire to buying a house and are in need of a house, but for one reason or another, be it not able to comply or whatever, uh, they're not able to do it. But the chances are that you will build a show house, you will show it, and so on. Somebody comes along, and as soon as you've got a deposit and a, and a contract signed, you will build on and on and on. But the bank certainly wouldn't allow you to build an extra 10 houses over, one, over and above what you have until those uh, signed contracts are there. Such is the type. That's probably not such a bad idea. But we need to speed that up, and if we're going to build the scale and, and so on, that needs to be uh, to be sped up in a fairly big way. So I would certainly, uh, you know, you have to appeal uh, in terms of the VAT um, that that it certainly is going to give an incentive to provide the stock. And uh, just like the, the VAT reduction on the hospitality sector, I think it was uh, introduced for a year and then it was rolled over. And we would suggest that this be uh, on very much a time, a time limit. And if there's evidence uh, that has not been passed on, then it's clearly up to the Minister for Agriculture or the Minister for Finance uh, to change that. Um, the 
Deputy Butler raised the issue about over-reliance on the local authority. Well, unfortunately, the local authority didn't really build any houses for a long time and still aren't. Uh, we would certainly support the local authority getting involved in direct build. And in terms of joint venturing, I think they will get very, very good value uh, if they come up with the designs and put it out to tender. They'll certainly get very, very good value from uh, the private building sector to provide those houses and the people have those skills and that capacity around the place. Um, the, I appreciate exactly what you're saying, that this committee is looking at the, at the national picture. And, you know, we're a national organisation as well. We've just had our sort of roadshow around the country. And you'd need to be very, very careful how you would describe uh, the recovery in the industry when you go down to Tullamore or to Sligo or to, uh, to, to, to Waterford. And we had our, our first one in Waterford. You'd need to be very careful how you were uh, uh, articulating the recovery in the industry because it isn't felt down there. And it's lucky that there's a motorway from Waterford to Dublin because an awful lot of the Waterford builders and elsewhere are coming to Dublin seeking work and travelling up and down uh, on, on a daily basis uh, to try and get that work. So that's, that is still the issue there. Uh, the 240k for a four bed house in Waterford, you certainly wouldn't be able to build it at the moment. And until that stock is, is, is used up, and if there is a social housing need there, I think uh, the, the different local authorities and the housing agencies should take advantage of the stock that is there to, to fulfil that need. Frisbee Construction, I heard it on the radio on Friday, they were advertising them. Well, good man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, yeah. he's one of our members, actually, yeah. uh, and he'd, yeah. be, he'd be giving you a very, very good, a good, uh, good value at 240k if it is possible. He clearly has a very good side. Sorry, just in relation to that, off what's on, and there's an awful lot of misleading, and we've been through this with, in a recent session where, where with the costs, and I'm sure the society charts or various may be able, able to add to this as well. But an awful lot of these instances around the country, what you have is what people have done is, is where they had roads and services already in place in a lot of these, and the cost of those is literally practically written off. It's just set aside for the moment, and they're just simply working on, which everybody has had to do for the last number of years, anyone who has done any bit of building at all, is you just set anything that you had done, half-built units, whatever. It was all about cost to completion, and whether there was a contribution then to debt, then beyond that, and if the funder was happy to take that contribution to debt, often a lot of the, 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 the cost is lost and there's actually losses in those instances, and there's many examples of that all over the country, uh, including Dublin as well. Okay, thank you. Right, De Deputy Function, function um, uh, you raised the issue about the wage increases. Certainly, um, you know, it's, it's supply and demand. Uh, we, we're incur engaged in, uh, with the unions at the moment in dealing with some uh, wa wage uh, uh, increased demands. Uh, there is a new SEO uh, in place instead of the old REA, and we're dealing uh, with that as well. Uh, and if anything, I suppose it will be um, the, the, the demand is upwards. Uh, but if you're a tradesman at the moment, um, you know, you certainly will be able to negotiate good terms for yourself. There's no question about that. Um, I'll just let, in terms of the, you mentioned the urban regeneration uh, again, and I'll just let maybe Hubert uh, refer to that because certainly uh, we see major scope for that. And, you know, in the past, uh, some of the housing or some of the ghost estates were as a result of maybe over generous uh, tax incentives to build where uh, that demand wasn't. Uh, and that's something that the industry and people got involved in it suffered from as well. Uh, so clearly I think this needs to be tailored very, very well. Uh, and I think Hubert has specified that pretty well in, in the suggestion that uh, it is very specific. And, um, you know, it is the sort of work that if you take uh, a, a Carlow town, Bagnallstown, for example, uh, that there is scope to renovate uh, 20 units uh, over the shop or whatever, you know, the typical people that would be have the skills and have the know-how to do that are all living within probably seven or eight, ten miles of there. And I have no question that if they were good quality uh, living spaces, that you will have people that will take them up as well. Mr. Fitzpatrick. The urban regeneration, that would be strictly defined, a red line around a particular area, what's actually needed for that area. So it's quantified, you don't result in any oversupply of any particular issue, and that development be incentivised in, 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 in that particular area. Just one or two other points. Just in relation to the part five, the industry is not walking away from social housing. The industry was suggesting that the local authorities would still retain a right, a right to acquire up to 10% of the units in all those developments. So this was not walking away from the social housing requirement to ensure that you have social development in, in those areas. And the other point then mentioned in relation to the restructuring of the local property tax and the section 48 levies. You know, there was, there was quite a, 
an extensive list of infrastructure prepared by all the local authorities which would be funded from the Section 48 development levies. And really, with, with the changed economic climate, one needs to relook at that list of infrastructure again and determine what is essential and what is desirable. And let's focus on the essential infrastructure to be provided under the Section 48s, rather than try to fund an extensive list, which clearly is not affordable in the current climate. Thank you. Mr Dempsey, before we conclude. Yeah, uh, very quickly, just a general point on the availability of funds uh, pertaining to uh, Deputy Cowan's comments. Um, there is a market failure in access for finance, for particularly for the SME uh, developers and particularly in the, the regions as well. So um, it's our belief that there's a, a number of EU uh, Commission funds um, under financial instruments and the cohesion uh, funding um, that could be merged and blended together to provide low-cost finance to um, small and medium enterprises, particularly in the regional areas. And that is essential to make it financially viable again for these people to build in a balanced and regional way across the country rather than just being in the greater Dublin area, Cork or, or Galway. So uh, we think that this committee and, and we would be happy to work with them on investigating that further. Thank you very much. At this stage, uh, colleagues, I'd like to thank the CIF for appearing here this morning. Uh, Mr Dempsey, Mr Fitzpatrick, uh, Mr Parland, Mr O'Neill and Mr Neville. Uh, and not just for your answer to the questions, but I think also the document you supplied, while uh, you can see there is a, a diverse range of views on some of the suggestions you made, um, and the next session will probably explore some of those a bit further. So thank you very much for your attendance and your submission. Thank you. Uh, we will... Uh, now suspend the meeting briefly to enable our next witnesses to take their places and we'll continue straight away. Thank you. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon and you're very welcome. Um, at the outset I just want to read the note on privilege. Uh, I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of Section 17.2.1 of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you're directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to so do, you're entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You're directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you're asked to respect the parliamentary practice to that effect. Where possible, you should not criticise nor make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him, her or it identifiable. Your opening statements have been submitted and will be published on the website. Members are reminded of the long-standing practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. And again, to mention in relation to the mobile phones, if you could either turn them off or uh, on the uh, flight mode as the proceedings are being recorded and broadcast. Uh, I'd like to welcome the Society of Quantity Surveyors uh, Ireland, represented this afternoon by Ms. Patricia Barn, uh, Director General, Mr. Michael Mahan, and Mr. Michael Cleary. Um, Ms. Barn, would you like to make an opening statement, please? Yes, thank and you very, very much. Um, thank you very much for the uh, invitation here today. Uh, my name is Patricia Byron. I am the Director General of the Society of Chartered Surveyors Ireland. To my right, uh, I would like to introduce Micheál Mahan, who uh, is in private practice, uh, but is Chairman of the Society's Quantity Surveying uh, Professional Group. And to my left, uh, Michael Cleary, also in private practice and a member of the Planning and Development Professional Group within the Society. Uh, what I would like to do is give you a brief introduction uh, and then I'll pass over to uh, Michal and Michael to kind of talk about the uh, technical side of this homelessness and housing uh, debate. So uh, the Society is a professional body. Uh, we look after the Charter for uh, Chartered Surveyors uh, in Ireland, uh, but also you'll see a logo on the slides, RICS, and we are a part of the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors worldwide with membership of about 100,000 uh, all the way to the far side of the world and back. So we would see ourselves as the cutting edge of the property sector in the, in the largest sense, in the widest sense. Um, 
The disciplines, just to give you a sense, there's a wide variety of uh, disciplines. There's quantity surveying, building surveying, mineral surveying, geomatic surveying. Um, we look after anything from the land up, really. Uh, facilities management, the rental side, the property side. So you'll find auctioneers and valuers. Uh, you'll find, as I say, uh, the technical uh, surveyors, all part of this group. Um, the society is represented by public and private sector members as well. So you'll find our members in the Valuations Office in Ordnance Survey Ireland. Um, you'll find them in the Office of Public Works. You'll find them in large uh, construction uh, environments and, as I say, right down to the um, shop fronts in our local towns and villages where you will see, uh, I suppose, differentiating uh, factors when you see our logo, uh, Chartered Surveyors Ireland and the Royal Institute charge of surveyors. It's a mark of excellence, it's a mark of regulation uh, and it's a mark of uh, people who have spent four years doing a base degree plus three years uh, for a professional qualification. I'd also mention that our members um, in Ireland, there are about 5,000 in this society locally, of which a half are rural. So about 2,500 are rural and I'm sure most of you will have come across them in one shape or other. So there's a very rich vein of knowledge, qualification uh, amongst our members. I would also say that uh, we have been um, given the powers under the Building Control Act to register building and quantity surveyors in the country. So we look after that, we regulate them, we're the regulator in that regard, uh, and we make sure that they, they uh, I, spoke, I suppose, work to the highest of standards. Um, I think that in, uh, in respect of the presentation today, it, we believe that it's a time for political bravery, uh, and we will set out um, a number of key points which we have also put in a number of publications uh, into uh, the public over recent years. We have warned of the uh, lack of supply back four or five years ago. We warned about um, the lack of uh, building regulations and we see uh, where that has led us to, where we are retrofitting and now bringing uh, housing back into safe condition. Um, we've differentiated between uh, quality of building uh, standards and design, which is mixed up in many people's minds. And uh, we think that it's time that uh, I suppose uh, the voice of the professionals in this space uh, are, is, is taken on board. So now I'll pass over to Michal. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Um, well, look, as, as chair of the Quantity Surveying Professional Group, the quant Quantity Surveyors deal with, with, with cost of, of, of buildings. So, uh, obviously, in the past while, there's been a huge focus in light of the central bank uh, loan to income ratio, there has been a huge focus on the actual uh, cost of building houses. If we take it that there's a a limit on the central bank rules of a loan to income, then to get equilibrium we need the developers to be able to provide the units and achieve a margin within that, uh, within that space. So um, the problem is, and it's a problem across the industry, is that we're, we're relying a lot on anecdotal evidence and, and I suppose to digress slightly, one of the issues we've been looking for in, for quite a while is a, a department for construction, minister for construction, who can collate information, real-time, real-life, independent information, and monitor the effectiveness of measures that are introduced. That's, that's an aside, but going back to the, um, to the housing cost, uh, we have undertaken a very detailed study of housing costs uh, across the greater Dublin area. That study will be issued in, by next week, by the end of next week that will be issued. But the methodology we adopted was we took uh, 10 live housing projects, real projects that our members were involved on and have collated the data from that. Um, I won't disclose the... the, the, the Projects. These are 2016. They've just, the chairman, they've, they've just either wrapped up or they're currently on site. So it's real life data, but, but importantly, and it's, it's independent data. It's independent costs. So um, I won't. We'll have the report next week, and would we'll gladly go through the granular detail of that uh, with uh, the committee or any working group of the of the, of the committee, obviously. Um, but I suppose, in simple terms, the, the the cost of providing a house, it's not hugely complicated and there's only there are only so many key headings so um, just just briefly to outline the, the, the key ones obviously you have the hard cost of building the unit um, 
and as our report will disclose, that the actual cost of building the, the, the unit is less than 50% of the overall cost of delivery of a house uh, to the public. Uh, you then have professional fees, you have levies, you have land and development costs and, and the Part 5 levy associated with that. You have sales and marketing costs, finance and margin, which we would, we would put together in, in one bracket. Um, so the elements are there in how to analyse them and we'll gladly do that in, a, in as I say, in a granular detail with, with you at, once we get the report done or we can talk about it today. Um, so that study is done. Uh, we have made some recommendations, we've, 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 we can outline to you what if you reduce VAT to a certain proportion. We can outline to you in an in independent manner what the cost effect are of, of measures that you may introduce. So um, that's pretty much it, much it on, the, on the construction cost side for the minute. Maybe questions afterwards. I might hand over to Michael to, to, to deal with um, the overall. Uh, thanks, Michal. Um, so my area uh, of involvement is, is planning and also development. So it's, it's at the core face of dealing uh, with and for developers and the acquisition of land and the, the delivery of, of a variety of different uh, development projects. Um, and uh, it, I suppose to, look, to cut to the chase on some of the issues from a, a private sector output uh, issue, uh, the number one issue you've heard us before is, is construction finance, the availability of reasonable construction finance. Um, so uh, regardless of whether the house is affordable or, to, um, uh, or whether it's a market, open market transaction, just the physical supply of housing is being affected by the availability of construction finance. That's a legacy, as I think everyone's aware of this stage of the